All right. Welcome to episode one of the Chaplain Performance Podcast. I think that's what we'll call it. We're not sure. But uh, we're joined today with uh, my first time meeting, but my new buddy, Mitchell Gorley. He's a personal trainer out of just north of Toronto, small town of Alora. And uh, today we're going to be talking about a number of things, but we're going to center our conversation around recovery from pain, uh, as well as taking a mind-body approach balancing the exercise side of it with the mindset side of it. So, uh, Mitch, if you don't mind, could you just give a brief introduction of kind of who you are and a little bit about your background? Yeah, hundred percent. And I want to say, uh, first and foremost, thanks for having me. This is really cool. We were just kind of talking about, uh, what a, what a neat opportunity is to kind of meet and do this thing. So, uh, thanks for having me, man. Uh, yeah. So obviously you've kind of stated just, uh, the basics of who I am and where I'm from. Uh, I'm 27 years old. Uh, So in terms of uh, background, you know, sports, uh, movement activity has kind of been something I've always been super passionate about. So uh, ever since I was a young kid playing hockey, stuff like that uh, was kind of uh, who I was and uh, being active was a huge part of my life. And that just kind of progressed uh, as I got older. I work uh, full time as a firefighter. So, you know, uh, health and wellness is a huge part of uh, you know, of uh, my job and making sure that you're taking care of your body is really important to make sure that you can, you know, perform and uh, do what you need to do at work. So um, just as time progressed, I just continued kind of exercising, lifting, all that kind of stuff. And uh, right now I'm currently training for a half Ironman in July. So I still like to balance, you know, the lifting side of things and also have gotten into the whole world of uh, endurance sport, which is, uh, which is really neat too. So um, kind of best of both worlds, I guess, hybrid athlete, if you will, is the term that they're throwing around these days. So, uh, that's kind of, kind of where things, uh, where things sit right now. Uh, I think the reason, uh, in terms of my background is, you know, why you and I got, you know, in touch. Do you want me to kind of touch on that now or? Or I think this is going to be great for everyone listening. Right on, man. So like, obviously, you know, uh, I think everyone looking at me working as a, uh, you know, a firefighter, obviously a very physical job and as well now, you know, taking my passion for health and fitness, teaching others as a uh, personal trainer uh, from the outside, it looks like, you know, I got everything figured out and I've always been, you know, a super strong outgoing individual. But uh, a couple of years ago, I would say, you know, around 2018, I started to experience, you know, some low back discomfort, nothing crazy. Um, and uh, figured, you know, I got great benefits with work. So I'm going to go see uh, an osteopath who, again, just kind of searched up online. And uh, he did an assessment. And I had never had any MRIs before or anything like that. Um, just kind of some low back discomfort. Nothing that was, uh, you know, really interrupting my day to day. But again, I just had the benefits. So I said, why the heck not? Let's, uh, let's see if we can get this sorted. So Um, he checked me out, uh, did a quick assessment and, um, without any MRIs, his belief was that like, I had a spondylolisthesis, which I'm, I mean, sure. I'm sure you, Greg, as a, as a, you know, physical therapist could probably describe better, but my understanding was, you know, basically the vertebrae were sliding away from one another. And this was maybe causing, you know, the discomfort I was having. And he, you know, finished the session with being like, we're going to work on some core exercises. uh, But whatever you do, don't look online about like, you know, corrections for this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So of course, me being a human being, Uh I go online and the first thing I see is like spinal fusion, all this crazy stuff, Uh, you know, surgery around the back, just, you know, scared the crap out of me. So uh, despite his, um, (laughs) you know, his instruction, I looked online and immediately uh, you know, I'm freaking out thinking what's wrong with my back. I just went in here with some slight discomfort, thought this guy was going to maybe massage me and things are going to be good to go. So, uh, he was a big proponent of, uh, you know, Stuart McGill and like the big, uh, the McGill big three. So basically what he taught me in, um, in his session was that like, we're going to do these different sort of core exercises. It's going to stabilize the structures around the spine and everything's going to be great. Hmm. Um, so as you know, time progressed, I actually so slowly started to see that my symptoms were getting worse, uh, instead of getting better, uh, which was, which was alarming. So after a couple of visits to him, uh, he actually, uh, told me that I should go to another practitioner who actually specialized and had a PhD in biomechanics and, you know, no need to name names, but, uh, I was like, this is, you know, this has got to be it. This guy's going to fix all my issues. I mean, he's the guy, right? Um, so I went to go see this individual and, uh, he charged $300 an hour 
for um, the assessment and the assessment lasted uh, around three hours. And, and don't get me wrong, it was thorough, but um, again, he was uh, very, you know, under the belief that this had to be a biomechanic issue. And unlike the other individual who said it was a spondothesis, this guy said he thought it was a S1 L5 disc herniation that was, you know, causing the issues. Hmm. Um, and again, based on no MRI, MRI, you know, imaging, this was just uh, based on an assessment. So um, after that, like, again, he basically said more or less, let's do these core exercises, but he, you know, also implemented this thing called spinal hygiene which, uh, you know, for, for the listeners is basically, a, you know, a prescribed movement where they basically tell you not to flex your spine at all. So everything mm -hmm. is like hip hinging, you know, they teach like a golfer's pickup. So you're basically doing like a single leg hinge to pick things up off the ground. So um, no real spinal movement at all. So again, I thought this was, you know, I'll do these things, I'll be good to go, right? Uh -huh. uh, and sure enough, uh, like the other guy, me being, I'm a very like type A, I'll follow things to the end. You know, um, you tell me what to do, I'll do it. I followed everything to a T and sure enough, just like the first guy I went to go see, I saw everything just start to get progressively worse. Um, so I went from, you know, an individual with very minor back discomfort to now I was having like, you know, chronic pain. I was having flare ups, you know, uh, you know, fearing movement in general, because I thought, that was the, the thing that was causing my pain in, in the beginning. So I guess you can kind of see the trend here and without, you know, dwelling on things or, you know, drawing it out too much more. I went from like a healthy, very strong individual, someone who was always known as being athletic and strong to now someone who was downright fragile, man. I was afraid to sneeze or pick something up off the ground. Um, and that's basically, um, that was the undoing of a lot of, you know, the progress I'd made in sports and fitness. And it started this, um, you know, basically two and a half, three year journey to where I'm at now, where fortunately I've basically undone a lot of the things that I think have had happen. But uh, this kind of stuff is what I'm really passionate about now. And it brought me to individuals like yourself, because you can see how, you know, the wrong belief system that is instilled in an individual can, can be pretty detrimental, right? Especially when we have these authority figures, these doctors uh, telling us, certain things it's uh it can definitely lead us down two very different paths and you know looking retrospectively at my experience i wouldn't have changed it for the world because it brought me to where i am today and having so much uh you know of a better understanding of my body and you know all that kind of stuff but uh, certainly was a whirlwind and i know there's a lot of people that are kind of stuck in that pain cave and seem to be spinning their tires and uh you know it's awesome to have individuals like yourself that are sharing some really quality information and some science back stuff about like you know, modern day or present, uh, pain science, which is great. Yeah. Uh, I, it was, so I have a, a number of questions for you on this, but, um, kind of looking back, you know, if you think about maybe the one piece of advice or, um, even just caveat or little side note that you could have maybe received in those initial assessments that could have helped you to understand the context of, yeah, we have these biomechanical assessments, but then there is also this whole emerging literature about pain neuroscience and how neural pathway dysfunction in the brain and our nervous system can actually produce pain. And actually, in most cases, that's what chronic pain is, right? And so, For sure. you know, the, the question is like, what, how do you think you can bridge that conversation with someone? where you're saying, Hey, we do have these biomechanical assessments, but when it comes to pain, that's not necessarily always the cause, even though it be, it could be a contributing factor. For sure, man. Yeah. I think, you know, the biggest thing for me was every time I was going to get these assessments, it was always, you know, centered around my body, which at the time made like a lot of sense, but you know, now knowing what I know, and again, you know, reading up on different things and understanding like the biopsychosocial model of pain and how you know, there isn't just a single cause for why you're experiencing pain. And the, the one thing that no one asked me is like, hey, what's going on in your life right now? What stressors do you have? If there's been any change, any loss, you know, in your in your in, in your family or anything like that, like nothing like that was ever even considered or brought up, which, you know, me now as a physical therapist, 
or sorry, not as a physical therapist, a personal trainer, uh, you know, that's one of the first things I ask my clients when, when they come in is, yeah, we'll do a movement assessment and we'll figure out how you're moving and how things are going there. But it's like, if they are dealing with any sort of like niggles or aches and pains, I like to get like a full picture of like, you know, what's going on in their life, what other factors might be playing into their, you know, their sensation or their motivation or their mindset at the time. So I think like a really big thing for me at the time would have been like, if that was a consideration where like, if I went into these, you know, uh, assessments with these individuals and they said, you know, we're seeing some things that may be attributing to your pain, but what's the big picture here? And I think like, you know, having that understanding of it, not just being like, this is broken, we got to fix it. But like these factors, we might have to tweak that might, you know, if we make changes outside might, you know, benefit how your body's feeling in general. I think that would have been a huge thing because for me at the time, all I was hearing is like, you're broken, you know, um, which was obviously, you know, to a young individual who my, my body was my livelihood, like not only in terms of fulfillment and enjoyment with sports as a pastime, but also with my job being like, if I am not physically able, this, you know, this isn't going to work. So then now that stressor kind of plays into the, the whole experience of like, well, if my back's messed up, I can't work. And if I can't work and you can see how this like, you know, cycle of pain and stress just can, can come on. Right. Or a lot of control. And, and what you're speaking to, I think is going to resonate with a lot of people. A lot of people that I talk to have this experience as well. But when you believe that the structural issue is the only issue and is the reason for your pain, then you think I'm going to mess myself up more by doing x movement or doing x activity right like so you're you're a firefighter the way i got into um got into this right was i was a musician and so for me it was like well i got hurt in the course of you know learning and playing and performing and doing this activity so now there's this structural problem that is the you know air quotes root cause of my pain mm -hmm. and so okay, if that activity caused this problem, then if I go and do that again, is that going to make it worse, right? Whereas, I mean, you can see where that goes, right? That gets really dark really quick. And so, you know, a, a, a more balanced sort of uh, piece of advice in the beginning is, hey, there's multiple factors at play here. There could be some structural issues, but those might not have even been what set off the pain in the first place. And for sure, contributing factor there are things here that, that can make this much worse, or there are things that you can manage that can make this process much easier and quicker. Right. And, uh, you know, I think for me, like, like for you, what happened was I, I found that there was a lot of pressure that came with this diagnosis on the mechanical side where it was like, okay, now I have something to fix. And until it's fixed, I can't do the thing that I like to do, or that is my livelihood, right? 100%. And so it puts you immediately in this mindset of you're broken, you're fragile, but it also puts you in, into a trap that, you know, I, I like to think of as the, I'll be happy when, I'll be ready when. Once 100%. I check off this box, then I'll allow myself to feel better, right? And without knowing it, you start to actually make a rule about not feeling good, right? Mm -hmm. So then you, you just prolong, you kind of push that ball down the road without knowing it. And then you're, you're not allowing yourself to even think about the chance of feeling good. Right. Because for sure problem with my body, got to fix it, got to fix it. What's the right thing. And so obviously with every failed exercise, you get further into that spiral and the pressure only increases, right? hundred percent. So I, absolutely. I just posted this, this earlier in, um, I think this is like an easy analogy for people to understand, but when we're talking about movement, right, pain, movement, whatever, it's really just, there are these little pathways in the brain that signals travel on, right? And so whatever route you take, you know, that's what you take. And so that route could involve an inefficient movement and you want to build new pathways or a new route to be more efficient, or it could be that those pathways are associated with pain. And again, you 100%. need to build new pathways. So uh, the way I think of it is like, you're taking the back roads to get somewhere. Maybe you get there, but maybe it's not efficient. 
and maybe you're sitting in traffic and it's not pleasant, right? That's like an inefficient movement or being in pain. And what you really need to do is build a, you know, a highway with a, a high occupancy vehicle, <laughs> high occupancy vehicle lane where you can, yeah. go and, you know, just go really quick. And you have to actually build that though, right? And like when you've been in pain for a long time, you have to rebuild those pathways. And so, like, what environment do you want to be able to build those pathways in? Do you want to make it rain every single day by putting a ton of pressure on yourself? Come on, that's got to work, right? But if you can bring the sunshine out so you can get out there and build the pathways that you need to, you build them faster. And by taking away the pressure, the negativity, all that mindset that you get wrapped up in, you actually make it easier and faster for you to actually achieve your goals. So it's like this paradoxical thing where you feel like maybe you're not trying as hard, but then you ultimately end up getting there faster. As a For result. sure. If your mindset is completely mechanical, completely biomechanical, uh, reason for pain, you're never even in the vicinity of knowing that that's an option. For sure. No, absolutely, man. And I feel like the one thing too, is, is like, you sort of just like, it's this confirmation bias in your mind where like that becomes the new normal, like being in pain is the new normal. And, you know, instead of trying to hunt out, you know, things to things that feel good or, you know, things that you're doing that are, you know, uh, working towards you making progress and, you know, recovering you're just fixated on like all the bad stuff right and it just yeah like you said it's just this it's this environment where like if you're constantly looking for things that hurt and are you know not helping you how do you expect to recover you know when that when that's the only thing you're fixated on you know the 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 chances of you actually you know getting better i think are are pretty slim so right and you know it's like you hear people talk about survival mode that's like a popular <laughs> Term that gets thrown around now and it's really like when you think about that confirmation bias that you're talking about towards negativity one of the big reasons for that is because we are literally wired as human beings to survive so we are you know if somebody tells us hey be be careful flexing your spine is gonna hurt you right it is not too far removed in our brain to think that means bending my spine is going to kill me and I'm going to die. For sure. Right? 100%. Like, and if we say that out loud, it sounds really funny, right? And people are, are going to be like, no, I don't think like that. But it's like, just watch how you behave, though. Right? Oh, 100%. Watch how your and, nervous system acts when you're in that state. Come on. And that's the thing. Like, it's not only the thought. It's, again, the, the nervous system, like, the, the human body is so incredibly fascinating that, like, it is going to create tension in those areas. And it's going to, you know, cause you know, those muscles around that area to be in a guarded state, because if you implant that belief in yourself, it believes it, right? Um, so, you know, our, our body is so, so fascinating. And it's amazing how we have this, you know, ability inside us through our immune system to heal, and it does that naturally, but it can also work the other way. And if we implant this belief in ourselves, our body will do everything it can to protect us. And if that means, like you said, making us unhappy, making us in pain, making, you know, it'll do what it needs to do. Cause at the end of the day, like you said, we're not wired for, we're not wired for happiness. We're wired for survival and that's it. Right. So, um, it, it's amazing what the, the human mind can do in order to ensure that, you know, we just continue to, to, to thrive, but not necessarily in, you know, a happy, you know, frame of mind for sure. Yeah. And it's, it's funny because, you know, some people listening to this, their objection is probably going to be, okay, that's all sounds good. But how about the real physical stuff inside the body? And, you know, it's so interesting. You, you mentioned just a couple of things there, but the one that stuck out to me was immune system, right? And so one of the things that we see popping up a lot these days is all these different autoimmune type things going on, right? Either autoimmune or autonomic nervous system dysregulation type, you know, um, conditions or diagnoses or whatever. And, and so it's like, people are like, well, there's this physiological thing going on in the body. What is that? And they don't realize that a lot of that can be at least associated with, if not caused by the mindset that you come at it with. Right. So just think of what autoimmune even means, right. Mm -hmm. It means attacking the self. Right. So when you perceive your body is something other or something that needs to be dealt with or fixed, right? What is your immune system going to do? How is it going to behave? 
right? Absolutely. And when you think about it in that way, it makes perfect sense why we see a lot of these things, you know, and, you know, I would just, I would direct some of the listeners if they haven't already to check out some of the, um, like even just the Andrew Huberman podcast where they talk a little bit about um, the actual physiological effect of like a placebo, right? Um, because placebo is, is something that has this negative connotation in, you know, like the, the mainstream dialogue, let's say, right? And they think, well, if it's a placebo, that means it didn't have a physiological effect, right? And it's like wrong. That's totally wrong. Placebo actually means just what you believe is positively impacting your reality. And that reality includes your physiology, right? So maybe yeah. you could for the, for the listeners, um, could you break down the difference between a placebo and then a nocebo for those who don't Absolutely. Know? And I'm so glad you brought up placebo because one of the biggest books, uh, you know, not to push any sort of books or anything, but one of the biggest books in like the beginning of my sort of recovery was you are the placebo by Joe Dispenza. And, uh, Basically, it studies or talks about, you know, the, the study of epigenetics about how your thoughts and beliefs literally will change your genetic material, which is crazy. And I won't get too into that. But for, you know, any of the listeners that are looking to know more about, you know, the, the, the way placebo works, I would definitely recommend that book. But uh, yeah, like, as you mentioned, um, I think I'm, uh, I'm, I'm going to use myself as a classic case of what non-SIBO can do. You know, and uh, as you mentioned in the beginning, you know, I had these individuals that were telling me to to not move. Movement will cause damage. Movement will cause me to regress in my recovery. Um, and sure enough, that is exactly what happened is, you know, they told me not to move. So I became very stiff and rigid. And in doing so, you know, my 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 daily pain went up, you know, my instance of uh, flare ups, if you will, went, uh, you know, went up. And that's, you know, a prime example of you, if you implant this negative or this like fearful belief in somebody, it can actually work contradictory to what a placebo can do. Whereas if you instill, you know, a belief in an individual, um, whether that's through a fake pill, a fake injection, a fake surgery, even, which is, you know, has been studied, um, you can, without even giving someone any sort of pharmaceutical or, even doing anything to the actual structures of the body, that belief that you've implanted in them creates massively positive change, not just incremental. You know, you look at some of the placebo studies in the past and, you know, the, the stuff you read is just, it's, it's jaw dropping. And it, and it really, you know, opens your eyes to how, you know, important this, you know, what we cultivate up here, what, you know, what thoughts, what beliefs we water in our brain, how much that can, affect our physical well-being our mental um, our mental well-being just our overall well-being is so so influenced by uh you know our our thoughts our thinkings our, our beliefs which uh, you know has just caused me to you know delve so deep in this world of mind body because i just realized you know obviously there's conditions that need to be treated with medication you know like you said we're, we're never discrediting that there's you know there's a plethora of conditions out there that require, you know, medical intervention, surgery, things like that. But there is also a lot that we can do just through mindset. Um, and I, I'm sure you've seen it. I've seen it with my own personal, uh, you know, story that uh, what, what a difference it can make. Yeah. So was there a turning point for you? Um, or maybe it was your friend's book, but um, like, what was it that kind of gave you that first insight into, wait, maybe the way I'm approaching this or what I'm believing or the, or the way I'm looking at this is actually a bigger issue than the so-called structural issue at hand, right? So like yep. how you're relating to it being more important than the actual content of the issue. Right. For sure. And I think there is, there's, there was a turning point. There was like a turning individual, which, you know, uh, I don't go to see him anymore because I don't see the need, but there was an individual, we're not, again, uh, no need to name names, but he was a PT and his name was Sean and he worked at a, uh, um, a clinic that was relatively close to where I live now. And I actually got uh, recommended because, you know, as you mentioned a lot in your videos, which I love this expression is, you know, the uh, rehab purgatory uh, which we all find ourselves in when we're struggling with these issues, which like I was textbook, I was, in, I was 
deep in the purgatory. I was bouncing from, I was going to, I was going to a couple of different people a week, you know, that that's, that's the stage I was at, but I'm uh, purgatory, by yeah. the way, for all the listeners, <laughs> if you're seeing <laughs> more than one cook, if you're seeing four cooks in the kitchen, you're definitely there. So uh, if you were yeah. one of them. And if you, and if you thought things were stressful and now you have four different doctors telling you four different things, like, anyways, uh, <laughs> that's, a, that's, that's a chat for another day. But uh, yeah, I had someone at work recommend this guy. So I'm like, you know what? I've been to 57 different physiotherapists. What's, you know, what, what's the difference with uh, 58? So sure enough, I went to go see him and, you know, I was getting pretty good at the, the, the shtick, the story of kind of how I got to where I was. And I'll never forget, he looked at me like dead in the eyes, straight serious. And he said, I want you to forget everything you've been told. And like that, that I think was like the true turning point. So he's like, you know, we're going to start to do some of these movements. And, you know, to my, to my shock, none of them were core strengthening exercises. Um, I think what Sean at the time was trying to do is like, you need to move your spine, man. Like you need to move your body. You need to start taking this super, you know, fight or flight sympathetic nervous system that is in this complete fear mode. And you need to, you know, show yourself through movement that like, it's okay, you need to let go our body. Again, we have this innate ability to heal ourselves, like things are going to be okay. And that's when he, uh, you know, him saying that as well as prescribing me, there's this little pain uh, workbook um, that he sent me, which was basically like a 50 page document, which, mm -hmm. you know, basically talked about neuroplastic pain and how pain becomes chronic and, you know, a couple of different studies. And I think, you know, meeting him and, uh, you know, along with like, that was my first introduction to basically, yeah, you know, neuroplastic pain or anything like, you know, along those lines. And then I think, you know, my eyes were open. And as I started to do the things that he prescribed and not to say that these were the right, wrong things, I think it's all, you know, situational dependent, depending on the client that a PT like yourself is working with, but you know, doing things like Jefferson curls, you know, in, in, you know, incorporating some mobility again, just like teaching my body that like, you need to like take some of the tension out and you need to trust that like, you're not broken. You are strong, you are capable. Mm. Uh, and I would say, you know, he was the one that, you know, really turned things around. And I remember there was a couple of sessions near the end when I, you know, felt that I was, making massive strides where like I wasn't even there to get treatment. I was just there to talk to him. Right. Like, um, you know, I was, I was so thankful for this individual, right. Like I just wanted to be there and, you know, tell him how much I appreciated what he did for me. And, uh, that was definitely, you know, a huge, huge turning point for me. And I think that was, you know, the beginning of the snowball of where I am today. Um, in terms of, you know, my beliefs, the things that I tell the people I work with and, you know, the, the sort of ethos that I live my life by now. Yeah. That, that, that leads me to a bit of a segue here. So I definitely found, and I would say more through working with people who are in pain that the adaptation I had to make as a PT working with others was that. I had to really embrace this new understanding of neuroplastic pain um, because the way that people were finding me was more through this mechanical lens of posture and breathing. And I, and I think in a lot of ways, sometimes when you're going from medical diagnosis, I need an answer with a medical diagnosis and treatment to I'm open to trying movement related stuff and having movement be the lens that I'm looking through. That can be like a stepping stone to let me look at my brain and the biopsychosocial model and all this, right? But the thing that was so interesting for me was when I started incorporating some of the neuroplastic pain work and, and doing it for myself and for other people, I just saw, first of all, people immediately got results with it. They appreciated the that level of interaction of, of including dialogue about, well, what's going on in your life? What's your emotional health like? What's your interpersonal life like? You know, do you like your job? <laughs> do you like your family? You know, do you like yourself? Like, For those sure. kind of stuff, you know, and I just found that that accelerated people's progress. And it was really something that in, in many ways, it caught me off guard. And, um, you know, we can talk about a lot of mindset stuff here. But one of the things that, that I made a big mistake with in my own rehab 
and that I think is really something that a lot of people make a mistake with is looking for the one thing, right? So it's like everything, so we're bullet. everything can be the one thing, right? And so, you know, for me, it was like in the beginning, it was, um, you know, I started off and it was like Shirley Sarman. I don't know if you know Shirley Sarman, but she's one of the most famous PTs. She might be the goat, right? But she, she developed a system called uh, movement impairment syndromes or movement system impairments. I don't know what she calls it now, but, you know, I've done some of the coursework. I've read her books and she's influenced all the baseball guys, you know, and, and that whole brand of people who are very much up here in the Northeast. But um, so I got into that first and that was the first lens. This is the thing. And then it was PRI, Postural Restoration Institute. That's the thing. And I'm obsessive, just like all my clients, <laughs> just like a lot of people have trouble getting through pain. I'm obsessive. So I got all in on that. And I was like, this is going to be the thing. And then from there, you know, I found um, meditation and then that was going to be the thing. And then from there, I found Bill Hartman and I was like, well, that's going to be the thing. And then from, you know, Bill, then I moved on to um, the neuroplasticity stuff. And then from there, I got into this whole field of emotional regulation. And like at each point in that journey, I was convinced that this was the one thing, right? And after all that, what the point I'm ultimately at now is it's better to be able to look through all lenses, right? And take the pressure off all the lenses too, right? I Just like selecting the right camera lens for the shot you're trying to take, not trying to take every single shot with a wide angle or every single shot super zoomed in, right? It's like you need, you need what works best in that context. So my question to you is two parts. First, how do you how do you not do that? How do you avoid doing that? That's like the first thing. How do you avoid doing that? And then as a trainer, right? How do you simultaneously apply the lens of mindset, neuroplasticity, and then be able to pivot and look through a biomechanical lens or a mechanical lens or a load management lens when it's uh, necessary? Yeah, I think that kind of, you know, it was funny. I was just listening while you said that about being convinced that, you know, that one thing is the thing. Because I remember like when I thought biomechanics was the answer and I had people at, you know, at work being like, yeah, I got back pain. I'm like, yeah, you got to stop flexing your spine, man. Like it's just, it's simple uh -huh. as that. And, you know, yeah. it also brings to some, uh, you know, something we talked about, about like, you know, do you have these moments in your life where you think you have everything figured out? Like I've found the golden ticket. And then the next day it's followed by moments of, I don't know anything, you know, which is, I feel like, you know, you have to be open-minded to all possibilities because there's never just one thing that's going to fix, you know, any sort of situation that you're in. Um, and in terms of like how I, you know, incorporate that sort of mindset with my clients is that, you know, I, I, I I'm under the belief that, it's not always going to be like a neuroplastic pain issue. It's not always going to be a mobility issue, but if we can move better and change our mindset and we can incorporate all these other things, be more mindful, you know, have a more regulated nervous system. If we can do all these things, it's just going to benefit us. So it's just, you know, we we're stacking these bricks and, you know, in doing so, I think, uh, you know, we build this house of wellness. Um, right. And that, that, that's just, that's just what I preach. I don't think, you know, and I have individuals that come in and they've been told X, Y, and Z by a doctor, and they are convinced that it is this one thing. And I never want to discredit that because, you know, if someone has a belief, they're not going to, you know, believe something else until they're ready to do so. Um, so I feel like you have to kind of approach that very lightly. Um, but I think, you know, as you get to, you know, work with an individual, you have to start to incorporate these other beliefs, these other ideas, because, um, you know, I think even if it is one thing that might be the biggest contributor in your, your recovery, these other things that we can maybe be working on and, you know, the outside can, can definitely help, uh, accelerate the process. Like you use the, you know, analogy of hopping in the HOV lane, why would we sit in bumper to bumper traffic? and bang our heads against the wall, making like little progress in this one, you know, this one modality that we're using when we can use three, four to five different modalities, uh, you know, in conjunction with one another. And all of a sudden we're at our destination and, you know, an eighth of the time. So I think that's the kind of, um, uh, you know, 
message that I try to share with my clients is that there is a hundred, you know, I, I, the, the expression that, you know, gets thrown around at work a lot is there's a hundred ways to skin a cat. And there definitely is, there's a hundred different ways that we can get to our final destination, but let's use a couple of different ways and in, in order to allow us to do it maybe a little bit faster and, you know, go through a little bit less grief than we would have. Yeah. And, and I, I want to, um, highlight one of the analogies you just used. Cause I think it's a super useful framework for people is the, you know, brick by brick, you're building a house of wellness, right? Yeah. So, you know, just imagine if you put one brick and you're trying to stack a whole house on one brick, right? How is that going to go? You know, it's a ton 100%. of pressure and that brick is just going to crumble. And it's like, that might be a perfectly strong, good brick and worthy of using, right? And it's like, yeah. But if you put everything on that, what's going to happen to it, right? It's just going to crumble and fail. And then you're going to blame the brick, right? And then you're like, no, it wasn't the right size brick. It, it, you know, I need a different brick and or it needs to be used in a different way. I didn't know how to use it, the right, but whatever. And it's like, no, it's just that you put so much pressure on just that one thing, you know, that, that you basically doomed it to failure without knowing it. And, and a lot of times it's like people need to get, get, to get out of their own way in a way they don't know how to yet. And it's exactly sure. what you said, which is like the kind of, sometimes you have to meet someone where, where they're at and where they're at is this place that when you're on the other side of it, you say, oh my God, you don't have to do all that stuff. You don't have to bang your head against the wall. You don't have to sit in that bumper to bumper traffic right now. And so like, if you could give people just like some, maybe just like a couple of big things, like the foundational things that maybe helped you the most when you were in that rehab purgatory and you were trying to come out of it, what would... What would it be? What would some of those bricks be? Uh, yeah, I, I think this brick analogy is really great. And, you know, for some of the reasons we already spoke of is like, yeah, you don't want to build your foundation on one brick. And, you know, like we were mentioning about having to approach this kind of lightly. If someone comes in and they're experiencing pain, discomfort and issue, and they are on that one brick as a, you know, as a PT, as a physiotherapist, as a trainer, we don't want to come in with a sledgehammer and smash that brick from under underneath them. They need time to, you know, grasp these concepts and some of these concepts for a lot of people um are pretty foreign right like you're telling someone that they can basically think they're they think their way out of the issue they have like that you know that can be a tough pill to swallow for sure um but i would say uh for me uh the biggest thing was realizing that the issues that i may or may not have been experiencing and i know you know every time you search back pain the, the you know disc herniation, slip disc, it's the first thing you see. And then you see all the, you know, the um, treatments for that, where it's like, you know, surgery and this and that. And, you know, it can be very, you know, fear inducing. And I think the biggest thing for me was realizing that like, that stuff's normal. Like if you're an active, you know, young adult, um, there's a pretty good chance that you might have herniated disc, a slip disc, a bulge disc, and that's okay. And like, understanding that, you know, these are basically wrinkles on the inside. Like if I just had something so simple, you know, ex explained to me in the beginning, it would have totally changed my mindset. But, you know, and there's this, there's this thing about, especially around the spine is like, we think spine, we think spinal cord, we think paralysis, we think all these crazy things. So it's like, huh. you know, you hurt your knee, I'll go run 15 kilometers on a bum knee, like I'll, I'll, I'll grit through it. But, oh my God, if my back's hurt, there's not a chance I'm going to do anything. Cause like, Next thing you know, there's a good chance I'm going to end up paralyzed. Like that's where your mind goes, right? Mm -hmm. So I think, yeah, first and foremost would be understanding that like these, these issues are normal. There's nothing to be worried about, you know, um, understanding that like there's people that have these, you know, structural abnormalities is the term I always throw around and, you know, it's like, it, there's people that are walking around with these structural abnormalities that are in zero pain. Like if I just understood those things before this whole process even started, and if I just had, you know, a, a Greg Chaplin in my life to be like, Hey man, like this stuff, you know, everything seems to be looking all right. You're in a bit of discomfort. You know, maybe if we, you know, focus on, you know, reducing the stress in our life, getting better sleep, you know, eating whole foods, like these getting sunlight, like these little things. It's like, instead of thinking surgery, cut my back open three month recovery, I thought sunlight, sleep, and, you know, eating my Wheaties in the morning, 
the, the past would have gone these two ways. And, you know, unfortunately for me, fortunately, I guess, as I say now, because I'm so grateful all this stuff happened because I can look at it retrospectively is, you know, one of the greatest thing that's, things that ever happened in my life. But uh, it, it's amazing what a few words and some, you know, some words of encouragement can do just to, you know, provide someone that peace of mind. So, yeah, I guess if I could kind of, you know, boil it down to one thing would be like peace of mind. I just needed someone that, you know, I could look up to an authority figure to tell me everything was going to be okay. And I think if that was the case, uh, you know, things would have been a lot different than what they were. Yeah. You know, it's, it's interesting. We've got just a couple of minutes here. So we're going to be wrapping up soon, but you mentioned, and I'm going to just tie this back to this way in the beginning of our conversation about how you went to that person who was in that position of power, who had that PhD and said, Hey, we're going to do this big, expensive, long assessment on you and talk about the mechanical issues going on with you. And in that course of that dialogue, that individual had every opportunity to say, Hey, we're, we're looking at this through this lens, but there's, you know, probably nothing wrong with you. Right? This is all normal. Like they had every opportunity for that and you didn't get that. Right. And I, and I, I would say that one of the things that I appreciated the most is I went to the mountaintop as far as I was concerned to work with Ron Haruska at PRI. He's the founder of PRI. And um, he, you know, he was listening to what I was saying in the words from his mouth. I'll never forget him. He goes, Greg, there's nothing wrong with you. And that was like the peace of mind I needed to feel that I was allowed to heal now. Yeah. hundred percent. And to, and to know that like, you know, we had these individuals that telling us, you know, you have to do these exercises three times a day, five days a week, you have to do this stretch, you have to do this, you know, listening to what you just said, you didn't need any of that. You didn't need the, you know, the, the three page document of the exercises you were going to do to get better. You needed someone to tell you, you're going to get better, you know, and that, and as soon as that belief was implanted in your head, and you, and you know, you believe what that individual is saying, I think, you know, the rest just takes care of itself. Like once we, once we truly in our heart of hearts believe that there's nothing wrong with us. And even if there is something that is, you know, uh, needs some work that we are going to get better in the long term, if we have that, you know, seed planted, I think, you know, 90% of the work is already done, right? Yeah, I totally agree. Um, Mitch, it's been a freaking amazing conversation. Um, anyone that's listening, go to the Movement Mindset PT on Instagram, follow Mitch. He's got a lot of great content on there. Um, it's always helpful to have reminders about this stuff in your feed. And um, if you can get following a couple of, of accounts that look at it from this angle, you know, we're not asking you to give up looking at the other stuff yet. Um, you yeah. know, but it's like if you can look through multiple lenses and be able to manage, you know, contradictory beliefs, honestly, you know, um, if you can learn that, if you, if you can do that, it's going to provide you this, this opportunity to be curious about the different ways to deal with yourself. And I think that's one of the biggest things about getting through chronic pain is just giving yourself that space to be open to learning new things that can help you, you know, and I, I'm hoping that everyone listening to this podcast will have been helped by maybe hearing some new things that we brought up today or hearing us reinforce some things that they already know, but are beneficial to hear. So uh, Mitch, any last words before we wrap up? No, man, I just want to uh, say, uh, yeah, thanks for having me. It's been an absolute pleasure. I, I think I said this to you before, and I'll say it again. I think, you know, the stuff you're putting out, the content you're releasing is some of the most underappreciated content on the internet. And, you know, I wish I, uh, you know, met an individual like yourself three years ago, because again, my tra trajectory would have been very, very different. You would have saved me a lot of time and pain, but, uh, you know, I'm glad that, uh, we could link up and have a conversation in person, uh, in person. And, uh, you know, like you said, I'm, uh, I'm hoping the, uh, the people listening along, uh, found some value here and if they got any questions, I'm, uh, I'm sure there's uh, there's an opportunity to talk to yourself or me, reach out on Instagram and I'd be happy to, uh, have a chat as well. All right, guys. So that's a wrap on episode one, Mitch Gurley, everyone. All right. <laughs> See you guys later. Bye. Take care.